some episodes in World War II, they're compared to chess. Some are compared to checkers. But rarely do we compare operations to poker. But I would argue that Operation Berlin is more about bluff and potential than it is about the cards that anyone actually had in their hands. I would argue that Operation Berlin is about perception and especially important perception of strength and capability than it is about the reality of what was there. This is especially true when you consider some of the orders which were given to the various commanders involved. For the British, it was absolutely essential they were perceived to still have control of the North Atlantic. They would have controlled the North Atlantic. And there is no way the Germans can really take control of the sea away from the North Atlantic. At no point can the Germans really stop the British transiting the Atlantic. But if they lose the... Uh, they have the perception against them that they have lost control of the Atlantic. That is as damaging. Because perception, especially in a global war, is more than 50% of the battle. Perception, when you have a war for allies, a war for support, a war for influence, where people can still assist you, but maybe not assist you as fully as they might have done if they perceived you to be stronger, perception matters. Operation Berlin is all about perception. And that is one of the reasons why I have the question tour de force or tour de farce. Because you see, Operation Berlin can, certainly from a certain light, be portrayed as the most successful German surface raiding operation of World War II. They sink 22 merchant ships, they sail around the North Atlantic and parts of the Mid and South Atlantic with two battleships, and yes, the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower were battleships. I know they have 11-inch guns, but that's because that was the best gun the German industry could build at a time. That wasn't because that's the gun they wanted them to have, and not the gun they built them to have. One of the great things about the Scharnhorst is they actually have thicker belt armor than Bismarck. It's a joy. They did. But still, still, they didn't manage to take out a convoy. Their target was to destroy a convoy, roll up a convoy. And they didn't manage to do that. Yes, they destroyed stragglers. Yes, solo ships they managed to sink, capture. They even got some of them back to occupied France. It's a feat. But they didn't manage to roll up a convoy. And for Britain, therefore, even the German narrative of look at these ships we've taken just reinforced Britain going, well, you see, this is why we keep insisting on everyone running with convoys and this is why we need more convoy escorts and we need to be more far of convoys and more strict about convoys to all ship owners, etc. It, it's, it's, see, this is the point. If you're with a convoy, you're safe. If you're not with a convoy, look what can happen to you. So the British are still not perceived as weak. They haven't lost control of the North Atlantic. The Germans were able to go around and pick off these small fry, but a large prize eluded them. It's perception. The Germans, on one hand, get to portray this as a very successful operation. The British, on the other hand, get to portray this as a vindication of their capabilities, and also as a successful operation, because the convoy is not destroyed.
Both sides are claiming victory. Both sides are claiming they have a royal flush. But the question is, do both sides really only have two pair? Hopefully, hopefully, this video will give you an idea. But the point is, I'm going to, if I do it right, both make my case and my argument for my perspective, but also give you enough information that you can go away and disagree with me, if you wish. You can come up with your own ideas. You can put forward your own argument. Because that's what I really wanted to do as a video. It's also one of the reasons why this video is delayed. Because uh, it might have been re-recorded a few times <laughs> to get it right. <laughs> why am I doing a video a day for the Christmas period? Why? Well, three videos a day. Um, just, just giving me endless trouble. Travels, Battles and Darings. My book. A shameless book plug. Second edition is out. It's the paperback edition. It's a really cool book. It's a really nice book. And... Yeah. I have... Two other books close to publication. That will hopefully get there soon. But uh, those people who watch my channel regularly will know currently having fun, might be moving, dealing with some family issues of various illnesses and own issues vis-a-vis -vis, um, university employers. Not really playing cricket is the phrase I use for them. But all that will be sorted out and thankfully Unlike, sadly, far too many of my colleagues in history departments up and down the UK, I have YouTube. I have all of you. I have you watching the videos. I have you sitting through adverts occasionally. I, I do apologise for them, but they're a necessary evil to fund my research. And at the moment, also, fund of putting petrol in my car, but all these up to one side. And... Yeah, thank you. Without you, without your support, without the people who are members of the channel who do super chats and super thanks, without people who are patrons, and again, the people who sit through the adverts or are prime members. I apologise again for the adverts, they're necessary. It wouldn't be possible to keep this up. It wouldn't be possible to devote the hours, the days I sometimes put to this. But there again, Honestly, I enjoy doing it. You should never really do a job that you really enjoy. It's very difficult to turn off. <laughs> anyway. So we're going to start off with a little discussion. Because before you get into Operation Berlin, you need to sort of have a consider of um, some of the modern phrases and views we have in history. We have a lot of revisionists. Now, I haven't used a World War II article for this. I've used a World War I article. But this is from Matthew Seligman, who is a very, very good naval historian. And if you look him up on Amazon, you will find many excellent books by him. This is actually from a journal article of his, Naval History by Conspiracy Theory. And yes, it's on the First World War. But it's a rather good argument. And there is a specific section which I want to point you to. The extent of this world turned upside down begs the question, why is it that scholars have not previously noticed the many remarkable and innovative dimensions of British naval thinking in this period, a series of developments which, in the revisionist perspective, amounted to a revolution in naval strategic thought? There are many possible answers to this. The most obvious one being that not one of those supposed naval revolutions actually took place. 
Fisher proved unable to replace battleships with battlecruisers. The RN never came to rely on mutual sea denial for home defence. No battleships were dropped in 1914 in favour of submarines. No British admiral adopted medium-range tactics at any major surface action of the First World War. And when war came, a slow rather than a rapid economic warfare strategy was implemented. Thus, judged by results, each and every one of these revolutions proved a phantom. If they existed, they're easily missed. Now, why am I bringing up revisionist history? Well, First World War revisionist history. Well, because just like some of my colleagues who are pushing various ideas forward um, for the Royal Navy in the run-up to World War One as options, and my own view has always been that flotilla defence and all the other things are part of the overall British strategy. They're not replacements for any section. The Royal Navy is both large enough and broad enough in thinking that it can actually include many ideas at once. It can have multiple perspectives. And the joy of being as large as it was and as well funded as it was means that it can accommodate those perspectives. It can do. It can build battle cruisers and battleships. It can build a huge fleet of destroyers and a huge fleet of cruisers, which is actually, again, I've done a video about Jutland, is a good example of this. If you look at Jutland, the Royal Navy fleet that fights Jutland is a very balanced tool. It's got an appropriate amount of cruisers with it. It's got large torpedo, uh, torpedo boat destroyers. It's got a fairly balanced approach to its force structure. Then you look at the High Seas Fleet. It's not. It's got huge gaps. Once you compare it, even proportionally, there are huge gaps. And you realise that those gaps have had to appear because the Jones have had to focus their building because of their far less investment in a broader maritime infrastructure because the armies had to take precedence because, let's be honest, they've got a lot of land borders. So the army takes precedence. So you have to choose. Do you get cruisers or battle cruisers? Do you get a lot of torpedo boats or do you get some larger torpedo boat destroyers? What do you get? If you want numbers of torpedo boats, you settle for the smaller ones because you can build them quicker and with less. If you want to concentrate on getting battle cruisers and battleships, from your limited industry, then that means cruisers are going to suffer. Why? Because of turbines and other parts to do with engines. Because small vessels and large vessels use different sizes, let's say. But between cruisers and battleships, often it's very similar sizes and similar infrastructure units building those things. And it's just that battleships and battlecruisers have more of them. Which means, very realistically, you can have a point of, do we build a cruiser, or do we build free cruisers, or do we build a battle cruiser? So, that is that. Now, why am I bringing this up in conjunction with World War II? Because you've also had a lot of people for many years allege and make the case that the Royal Navy in the 1920s and 30s is moribund, that they have lost their way after World War I and they're basically a disintegrating force. It's a rather interesting thesis to make and it's based mostly in what happens post-1956-1966 and looking back at the Navy and looking at some of the issues it has and the malaise it has for a good few years. And they're often projecting the transition from being first navy in the world to second navy in the world earlier. The thing is, treaties had meant that Britain and America were given an equal ceiling. In reality of funding, the British were at their ceiling. The Americans lagged behind quite often. Not because the US Navy couldn't do it. Not because the US Navy wasn't smart enough or capable enough to do it. But because the US Senate wouldn't fund it. 
So far from being equal, far from the US Navy being the same size and power level as the Royal Navy for the 1920s and 30s, they're usually the number two Navy in the world. They could have been equal. They were allowed by treaty to be a Navy second to none. And yet, try and get that funding out of their government. An old story. But this also means that you have a very large Royal Navy. And a very large Royal Navy can be home to many schools of thought, many points of discussion, many learnings from World War I. Many things which will inform World War II and the policies taken place. I think one of the most interesting things that you have when we're looking at Operation Berlin is remembering that one of the people involved in writing and preparing the strategies for World War II was the third Sea Lord of the Royal Navy from 1933 to 1939 when he died. His name was Admiral Reginald Henderson. I'm bringing him up, or Reginald Guy Hannon Henderson, I'm bringing him up because, and this is important, because he was the man who in World War I wrote for Jellicoe the convoy paper which justified and allowed Jellicoe to force through over the objections of some of the admirals but mostly politicians and business magnates the need for convoys. Why did business magnates oppose convoys? Because if ships had to wait for a convoy, then they're not going to get run to your schedule. They're going to run to the convoy schedule. And that disrupts the flow of trade as the business was hoping for it. You have to start carrying slightly more stock. The whole just-in-time logistics we think of as a new thing, a post-World War II modern thing. Yes, it's very modern, just-in-time logistics. No companies have been trying, astute businessmen have been trying to run on minimal stock for a very, very long time. Why? Because you don't want to have a lot of money tied up in stuff you're not using or not selling. So if you have to start running on a convoy system, you are going to be faced with gluts and, well, nothings. So, it's kind of hard to persuade them. Now, you would think that those people had learnt their lessons by World War II. And you would think that by World War II, it was an easy scenario for the Royal Navy to get everyone to adopt the convoy system and fall in with the convoys. Not necessarily. In fact, whilst they did manage it on certain routes, on some routes the principal reason why convoys were slow to be adopted was because the owners of the shipping companies which run those routes were objecting. They were trying to make every case of why it wasn't necessary. And the owners of the companies which depended on those routes were also trying to make the same cases. However, a revisionist history will tell you that all the opposition for convoys came from the Admiralty, came from various admirals who didn't want to use their destroyers for it. And yes, there are some admirals like that. But in an organisation which literally has a couple of hundred people floating around with the rank of admiral or, various ra or the various ranks of admiral, um, at any one time in this period, broadly speaking. Yeah, you can find some people who hold some views. There's always the one percenters. There's always the one percenters. No matter what you do in any organization. The moment you're over a hundred people, there are going to be some people in there who have contrary opinions just for the sake of having contrary opinions. The moment you're having several hundred, well, hundreds of thousands of people in an organization, 
and it's spread across the world, it's very easy to find, even in leadership, some interesting views. So, with all that as background, this scenario, Operation Berlin, principally affects two critical convoy routes, HX and SL. And we'll get into those. Now, this is the route. This is the map. This comes from the UK National Archives. It comes from a document in there which is basically the Royal Navy's post-war write-up of what happened when they put together their information from their logs of where their ships were and every, they put together the information they gathered from the Germans of where their ships were. And they put it all together to try and work out where things were. By the way, it's a similar map like this which made the captain of HMS Cumberland hit a wall with rage. Um, well, it's reported by one story. I will say one account says he did that. Others say he just looked stony-faced. The former captain of Cumberland by that point, actually. Um, Post-war, when he realised just how close he got to the Admiral Graf's Bay. And, literally, if they'd zagged instead of zigged, they might have come within sight of them. They are that close. This is the voyage. It wouldn't have been possible without two things. And let's be honest, the most important enabler here is Norway. To get into the North Sea, in North Atlantic, they are going up the coast of Norway. Then they go north and round Iceland, through the Greenland, uh, through the Greenland Iceland part of the Greenland Iceland UK gap, the part furthest from British infrastructure, furthest from British air patrols. That's what they're doing. Furthest from the support. They're doing this in this way because it allows them a freedom of manoeuvre. It allows them to avoid British patrols. Again, if you go up the coast of Norway, there are islands everywhere. Little islands all over the place. If you're trying to run through it fast, you can, but you're all... It's, because it's difficult areas to be mined, it's difficult areas to be have just uh, to, uh, submarines put in, it's difficult areas for the British to go and try and poke their nose around and patrol. Later in the war, they have had potential trouble of running into dog boats because the Royal Navy NG, um, there were fair mile Ds, uh, they're motor gunboats and motor torpedo boats. The dog boats. Especially the ones based in Scotland, which do the Norway duties, are often running up and down the coast of Norway. They are often there. And that would have added another element to the joy of trying to get out, uh, get out into the North Atlantic. But at this point, they're not. At this point, you have limited air because, let's be honest... The major focus on medium and heavy bomber aircraft production is still focused on Bomber Command. Coastal Command is getting whatever's left. And the Royal Navy is still reeling from the initial decisions by Churchill when he became uh, First Lord, uh, when he became um, First Sea Lord. No, First Lord of the Admiralty. Sorry when he became First Lord of the Admiralty and decided to pause carrier and capital ship construction in the face of opposition from his own senior naval officers because that's what they did in World War I to concentrate on producing escorts. This is the fight, despite the fact the Royal Navy already had the Hunt Programme, the Flower Class Programme and various other programmes already running to provide escorts unlike in World War I. And this is despite the fact that it caused disruption in almost all those programs to try and move people across from capital ships to those escort program productions. And then a few months later, after realizing that might have been an error, to move them back. 
cause even more disruption. It was just a very, very silly, very, very short-sighted decision all round. There were some admirals who supported it, Lord Cork and Ori, and a couple of others. Basically officers who were refighting World War One. The fall of Norway was really the start of the point at which the decision starts to be reversed. Because your whole ability to keep the Germans in the North Sea is lost the moment Norway falls. The moment Norway falls, this becomes a viable operation. Okay? So, let me put this therefore into context. Plan Z. Uh, the idea of the Deutschen class being used as surface raiders against, uh, Br against Britain and France. Anything like that doesn't work if Norway is not under German control. The fact that Norway only falls, A, because of their government being, well, I'm going to put this politely, ill-prepared ostriches, is a small factor. But also the fact is that Hitler only decides to basically invade Norway on a whim. And the forces that are dispatched are a hope and a prayer. Without Norway, none of this would have been possible. Just makes the fall of Norway even more annoying, really, from a, history, from a British perspective. But it happens, and this is what you're now dealing with. The entire British strategy for fighting a war versus Germany didn't conceive the concept of both France and Norway falling. France falling is a problem more for later, and especially for the Germans getting away in the final dash. Let's be honest, if France hadn't fallen, they would have had to have go back on themselves, in which case they'd have found the gate that they had come through well and truly bolted shut. <sighs> Fun times. But instead, they don't need to. They can make it to France. And they do. So they have, thanks to two massive unexpected victories, an avenue from Germany into the North Atlantic, away from British uh, patrols and British ability to intercept easily, and they actually have a place of succor to escape to, to save themselves. One of the problems I often have with people who claim that the Royal Navy was completely outfoxed and unprepared for World War II is put yourself in the position of a Royal Navy Admiral in the 1930s and try and persuade the British government that they need to prepare for a war, let's say in 1930. Uh, try and prepare for a war that would take place start in nine years' time, where the war would start with Germany, which would manage to take Denmark, Norway, and France. Italy would join in, and then Japan a couple of years later. You are not only describing something beyond the unthinkable worst case nightmare of the Royal Navy. You were describing something which no politician would believe possible. That Germany would be so lucky that they would pull all that off. That they would knock mighty France out. France, which was its own house of cards. But they did. Who'd have guessed it? The unthinkable can happen in war. I mean, no one ever saw that one coming. Operation Berlin, when it works, well, 
It's a great voyage. They are out for two months. Two months. 22nd of January to 22nd of March. That is a feat. Okay. Luchens. Lord knows I won't give him much credit. I won't, because... The poor man was over-promoted several, several times and under-prepared and frankly had as much as he tried and was probably better than he's been portrayed in some uh, some movies, etc. as being. He was broken. And I'd argue he was broken by Narvik because he was the man who was responsible for building the light forces of the German Navy. Of preserving the destroyers and torpedo boats and fast boats of the of the Reichsmarine and building them under the Kriegsmarine. Those were his ships and he failed to protect them. He's given Sharnos and nice now. He tries to draw the British off. He doesn't draw the British off. They go into Narvik and they wipe them out. They gut the force. He both fails to protect them and he abandons them. Men who he trained, men who he had hand-picked in some cases to command those ships. Yeah. That does something to an officer. But this operation... He does well. He does well. Now, the concept of the operation is quite simple. They're going out to kill these. They're not going out to kill British battleships. This is the whole thing when Bismarck goes out. She's not out there to kill Hood. She's not out there to fight the Prince of Wales. She is not out there to fight anyone else. And it's the same with Sean Horst Neiser. They're not out there to fight British battleships. They want to avoid them. They want to kill these. They want to kill the merchant ships. Because the advantage for the British in World War One and World War Two was the same. No one built more tramp steamers than the British. The British would keep building tramp steamers. That's what these ships both are to an extent. The Germans famously, prior to World War I, were building a huge amount of ocean liners and everyone talks about how great they were. That's fine. Those are great status vessels. And the British were building a few as well as status and so were other powers. But what did British really ha Britain really have a massive advantage of? It's these merchant ships. And here is the unintended consequence of Norway, because conversely, the fall of Norway makes Britain's problem of defending the North Atlantic tremendously more difficult. The advantage of the fall of Norway is that it puts the incredibly impressive Norwegian merchant marine at disposal of the British. And honestly, honestly, it's a half a dozen of one and six of the other as to whether or which of those scenarios turns out more useful or more problematic. The thing is, these are a lot of useful merchant ships and they're going backwards and forwards. Many of them are in convoys. But what matters is trying to sink them. Stopping them going. Because, here is the thing, Britain, even though it has a lot more battleships than Germany has, and let's be honest, Germany has four battleships that they actually build in this period. They never have an availability of more than two at any one time, thanks to ships being in, in, reserve, in a sort of maintenance, being built, being commissioned, the fact that the Germans commission a ship but then it has to go through most of its final trials because they commission it before it's gone through its trials because then they can claim they have it. But let's be honest, it hasn't actually finished being put together. There again, the Royal Navy can't really talk too much because we have, of course, sent HMS Prince of Wales to the Battle of Denmark Straits and she went there with contractors aboard trying to fix her turrets. There are some small issues there, just, just small ones, but as a rule, Britain didn't do that. And you can argue the reason Britain's doing that is because of, again, <coughs> Churchill's <coughs> earlier decision. Churchill. 
150 ideas a day. Five of them good. 95 of them terrible. The rest of them interesting. Which is British code for, oh please, please no. But still. These are the targets. These are what they're out, and they want to stop the flow of them. The British do not, despite having more battleships, as I've already mentioned, have enough that they can afford to put a battleship with every convoy. Why? Because let's say they do put a battleship out with every convoy. A, that means they now have no battleships for anything else. Well, they need them for other stuff. They also have the Italian fleet to manage at this point as well, and they're looking at the they're, they're looking at the Japanese fleet and going, there's an issue coming there. You know, the first plans of moving Force H to the Far East <laughs> were considered a lot earlier than 1941. The main problem was what we would then replace Force H at Gibraltar with. Oh, we don't have anything to replace it because someone paused the construction of our carriers and capital ships. Which person did that again? I'm going to try and not mention that much more in this video, but it does keep coming up as a small problem because, you see, Britain's major advantage over Germany in the naval war was their infrastructure and the amount of ships and things they could produce. It's very problematic, therefore, then when you someone throws away that advantage because they don't listen to their briefings. Now, the problem when you have battleships especially coming out is that what are convoys escorted by? They are rarely escorted by a battleship. They are rarely escorted by a cruiser. Usually the convoy escort is made up of some destroyers, adapted World War I types with long-range fuel tanks replacing their torpedo tubes mostly, um, and some extra anti-submarine warfare gear. Corvettes, flower class, occasionally castle class towards the end of war, and frigates. And their major target, they're orientated around, is fighting submarines, because that is their principal problem. On top of that, later in the war they have um, some very nice escort carriers with them that will help with the anti-submarine war, but will also have put some fighters up to deal with the uh, condors when they come around hunting for convoys. Stop them guiding in the submarines. What you might notice there is there is a dearth of things which are really going to deal with a large surface radar. Why is that? Because A, there's a lot of convoys running around. B, Britain runs on a sort of reaction scenario where they have a couple of R-class battleships based for quite a long time World War II in Halifax, able to shuttle out with convoys when they think there's a high risk of a surface radar coming out. And B, it's because you, as said, you only have a limited number of capital ships. And let's be honest, if you've got a pair of Scharnhorst class cruisers to a battle cru <laughs> battleships turning up, uh, a county class cruiser is not going to be able to hold those two off. It's going to look like the Royal Pindy, but worse. Because at least the Royal Pindy had the excuse that it was an armed merchant cruiser. Although, if the Royal Pindy had been armed with torpedoes as well as guns, Lord help the Scharnhorsts. Both Scharnhorst and Eisenhower would probably have got sunk the ranges they let them get to. I mean, you have 11 inch guns. Deal with it at effective range. Don't let it get to the point at which it's pinging, up, pinging shells off you. That's just embarrassing. But the eastbound convoys, originating in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and same as Liverpool, the HX convoys, are critical convoys in World War II. They are really critical convoys in World War II. And here is the stats, because you will hear a lot of television, a lot of video, a lot of movies, a lot of all things, all sorts of media about the convoys which get hit, because those are cool stories about bravery and they really are cool the dirty little stats you find stats you they don't tend to gloss over quite quickly 
Eastbound convoys, HX convoys, totaled roughly 377 convoys. Cumulative, 17,744 ship journeys. Now, why did I say roughly? Because some convoys go the HX route, but aren't called HX convoys. But most of those get through as well, because most of those are fast convoys. And fast convoys have a habit of getting through quite well. 38 convoys out of 377 were attacked. That's a little over 10%, but let's be honest, that's close enough to 10% that between friends, which I hope by the time you've listened to me for 40 minutes, you're sort of considering me a bit of one. Or at least a friend in a sort of way of you listen to this person talk down the pub instead of just ignoring them while stopping on your pint. That's 10%. And a total of 206 ships lost. Now, the thing is, if you consider it against the number of ships that actually do the journeys, that can be a lot more than that. But if you think about it from the perspective of ship journeys, that's 1.2%. So 1.2% of ship journeys were failed to be completed. 1.2% because they were lost. Of those, only 110 ships were lost in convoy. 60 ships were lost straggling. 36 ships were lost while detached or after dispersal, with losses from marine accident and other causes included in that number. That's incredibly low for what was a very active war zone in World War II. The Battle Atlantic was furious. And yes, there is all the decryption traffic, uh, the decryption of Enigma at Bletchley Park and the, say, and the uh, traffic analysis going on that's helping them work out what the Germans are doing, and that does play a part. But another large part of that is the statistics of convoys. Convoys are moving constantly. They are a lot of ships concentrated in one part of the ocean. If you don't see them, you can't they hit them. And the thing is, submarines have a problem. They can only move so fast underwater. Therefore, it's very difficult for them to catch convoys. They have to try and position themselves in front of a convoy. Or they have to go on the surface to run at higher speeds. But if they're on the surface at running at higher speeds, then they can run into these. Underwater, it's an even fight. On the surface, the flower class Corvette tends to win. It has guns, more of them. It's a more stable gunnery platform than a submarine. That's that's saying something. A flower class Corvette and stability as a gun platform is a, is a big thing. And it has better fire control. Yeah, it does for its guns, because it's actually able to look down on its targets. It, these things help, okay? Add in later on radar and ASDEC, or sonar as the Americans called it. This is not something that you want to fight on the surface, if you're one of these. You don't. So... For that reason, these convoys are fairly good. However, a battleship doesn't have the same limitations as that does. It goes faster. It isn't relying on stealth to hide itself. It's relying, in the case of the Scharnhorst, on their speed, able to top a speed of 31 knots. They're also relying on their firepower, the fact that they can blast aside pretty much anything like this, ignore it completely and just blast straight through it. And that is really, really nasty. They can just blast straight through it. And destroy a convoy. Now the thing is, 
if you start getting out into the Atlantic on North Atlantic on a regular basis with large surface raiders, what are you going to force the Royal Navy to do? They're going to have to start securing their convoys, which means either they're going to have to run fewer, bigger convoys and have all the disruption of the industry and infrastructure that's going to be caused by that so they can secure them with with battleships or alternatively they're not going to they're not going to be able to run them until they've hunted down the battleships which are in there are actually in the north atlantic both are options they might pause convoys if they have to pause convoys that's as good as admitting they've lost control of the north atlantic it means they can't do that if they have to turn convoys into massive, unwieldy, unwieldy monstrosities to provide them with a battleship escort the whole way across the Atlantic, that's going to look like they're losing control of the North Atlantic. So they can't afford to do those things. And if they have to keep running convoys as they are at the current size as they are and provide battleship escorts, they're going to run out of battleships. So surface raiders getting into North Atlantic represent Britain with an unenviable, an unenviable list of dilemmas. It's pretty much the a strategic move that Germans could do. Now, prior attempts, well... They'd had some prior attempts. They kept having some issues, though. Um, the first one was delayed by the Thames-class submarine HMS Glide, which um, torpedoed Neisenau on 20th of June 1940. Neisenau is not particularly lucky when it comes to damage. She seems to be far more prone to getting hit than Sharnost is. And prior to that, that's when they attempted in June 1940. Um... Prior to that, they'd sort of been stopped by Royal Appendy because fighting the Royal Appendy, when they realised what she was, despite the fact they sunk her, meant they felt that their cover had been blown and the British were descending on the area like a pack of avenging, well, we'll go for um, werewolves because, frankly, wolves are just too kind. So they'd also had the joy of Norway, and these things had all delayed uh, delayed it until you got to January 1941. Royal Appendy, 1939. Then you have build up and eventually Norway. Then you have the torpedoing of Nisenau. And so by the time all the ships are ready, it's time to go. It's time for Lutyens to take his ships to sea, and it's January 1941. Now, Lutyens actually wanted to wait. He wanted to wait till Bismarck was ready. He wanted to go as a mighty mailed fist. But the reason he wanted to do that was because he knew what he was going to face. It doesn't take a world-class luminary to work out what the British response was going to be to a two-ship task force going into the North Atlantic. It's going to be form up their capital ships into three-ship task forces. Okay? The British are not in the business of fighting fair. They're not in the business of, oh, let's be fair. They've got two, we'll bring two. No. If you bring one, British bring two. If the, you bring two, the British will bring three. The thing is, though, that starts eating into their numbers fairly quickly because you have ships deployed in the Mediterranean. You have ships deployed elsewhere in the world. And you have ships which have been damaged and are being repaired and some which are being refitted and modernized and all sorts of issues which are being dealt with in this period which cut into your numbers. And you have the fact that Royal Oak has already been lost. The British have lost a capital ship. The British have lost Courageous and Glorious, two of their key aircraft carriers, two of their larger aircraft carriers. And more importantly, when they lost those, they lost large numbers of their damage control certified officers. They lost a lot of their carrier experience personnel. 
because what those were the two key postings prior to the arrival of HMS Ark Royal. Those were the two key carriers. They've been lost through ignoring British doctrine, ignoring the doctrine the Royal Navy had actually put in place in terms of how carriers were supposed to be manoeuvred and coordinated with fleets and movements, and in the fact that the confirmation bias of exercises had suggested that aircraft carriers for some reason would be safe in an anti-submarine warfare operation. The thing is, in an exercise, you know roughly where the submarine's going to be operating. Lutyens knew all this. Lutyens' view was if you wait till Bismarck is ready, then you tie the British into four ship groups. Which means, in effect, because the odds are Prince of Wales is going to be ready, Repulse hasn't been upgraded, uh, but is probably still going to be in service. Renown has been upgraded as a service, and if you waited till Bismarck was ready to take Sharnos and Nisen out, uh, as well, combine them all together. You never know, Hood might have even gone in for maintenance and refit. I, the odds are Britain ends up with four fast ships. Perhaps they have five available, in which case Repulse probably gets hooked up with Rodney, Nelson, probably HMS Queen Elizabeth. And those are your two four-ship groups. Renown, Hood, King George V and Prince of Wales. Repulse, Rodney, Nelson, Queen Elizabeth. From what's available, that's probably what you have to go... You have available to go and uh, go and deal with a three-ship task group. Let's be honest, one of those groups they can outrun. And one of those groups is dependent upon two battle cruisers. To fight alongside two fast battleships which have issues one of them's worked through them but one of them's still working through them against three fast battleships at least you probably have a carrier per, for each group you probably have a carrier for each group you've got furious arc royal and victorious wandering around but the thing is luchens wasn't listened to Luchens wasn't listened to because Hitler wanted something done. He wanted something done right now. He wanted to be out. He wanted to be out impacting on the Royal Navy. He wanted to be out affecting the Royal Navy. He wanted to be out dictating to the Royal Navy. He wanted the image of the aggressive naval force. He also wanted to do something which they hadn't done in World War I. Break into the North Atlantic with large surface ships. He wanted to go further. He wanted the status, the glory. And like most, well, I was going to say small children, but let's be honest, underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped human, uh, human psychologies, he's into instant gratification and can't wait. I've met small children which are far better at put del delay gratification than Hitler seems to have been at some point in World War II. <sighs> the people who become national leaders. But that doesn't really have a bearing on this particular occasion, other than setting the scene. Because once you're out at sea in this period, and honestly, even to an extent today, once you're actually in the zone, you're really beyond much interference by the political powers that be. They set the rules of engagement. They can set some limits. But in the end, the interaction of two forces are what are going to decide things. For example, Bismarck had the same 
operating criteria and limitations as Sharnos and Eisenhower to avoid fighting superior forces. However, it couldn't outrun Hood and Prince of Wales, so it had to fight them. And yes, broadly speaking, you could say it won that fight, as damaged as it was afterwards, but it gone BB'd Hood, so that's a fairly convincing point in the win column. However, from the moment it had that fight, its days were numbered, and it can't avoid the fight with Rodney and King George V, as much as it would like to, as much as Hitler's orders were for it to do so. You just can't. So some rules of engagement and these whole plans set by higher powers within a government structure, they're like anything. For both sides, they rarely survive first contact with the enemy. Interesting enough, um, the Germans found themselves dealing with the British shaping of the conflict from the get-go. There's the fact that the Kiel Canal is routinely getting, um, how to put this, mined and other things, which means that they don't want to go out that way. They're going out through the Denmark Straits. And besides which, they're going up the coast of Norway. It's far more simple to go out and just hug the coast of Norway the whole way up. But then they have to deal with ice. This means that, well, when they're going to straw belt, the central one, the one that runs between lots of very interesting places which are small populations and may have lots of ham radio operators, etc., the likelihood of them getting spotted is high, and they do. So the British hear they're coming. The British now know they're coming. It's helpful. It's helpful. They also run into more problems in that uh, the torpedo boats, which were supposed to be there to escort them, because, of course, they don't have destroyers, aren't ready on time, and that causes a delay. And delays just keep building up. Delay upon delay upon delay. eating into their fuel, eating into the operating of their support ships, eating into all the things they need to carry out the operation. The lays are quite literally giving the British time to organise and giving the British time to prepare whilst also diminishing their ability to do things. Now, some of the, uh, some of the reaction of the British are going to be quite simple. Um, we have battleships in Halifax. Do we have key convoys going across? Yes. Deploy battleship. And here is the first critical target. This was the target they were really racing after. If you remember this picture, which I discussed earlier. This. This map. If you look for Halifax there, you'll find it over here. And you'll find that that's area there going straight into the operating area of where that convoy is supposed to be. And they're, they're, they're right up their timeline. It's almost as if the Germans are getting the information they need for this one. And they're heading for it. But there's a small problem. We look at this convoy. It's not devastated. Two vessels become stragglers and get sunk by U-96, but there are a lot of merchant ships here, and the rest of them all get through. Let me look at the escort. Well, we've got flag-class corvettes. Cool. We've got town-class cruisers. Mm -hmm. We've got Admiralty S and R, you know, Admiralty S-class destroyers and R-class destroyer. They're all World War One vintage destroyers. Got ASW anti submarine warfare trawlers, cool. And we have HMS Ramillies, a revenge class battleship, which joins them for the 30th of January through to the 10th of February. joins them for the 30th of January through to the 10th of February.
Nisenau and Scharnhorst had broken out, sailed from Kiel on the 22nd of January. They had passed the Straits of Denmark on the 23rd of January. And they managed to make their voyage on the 25th of January. Revenge is with the convoy from the 30th of January to the 10th of February, but from the 30th of January. So from the beginning, to escort this convoy, which British now is full of key stuff, they have her there. There are other ships which turn up later, let's be honest, in the escort. You can go through that escort list and you can go, oh, oh, these turn up on the 12th of February. These, this group, destroyer group, turns up on the 12th of February. Okay. She has a HMCS Collingwood with them at the, as they begin. But from the 31st of January to the 12th of February, or rather 31st of January to the 10th of February, She's their escort. She is their escort. For a small part, they have no escort, but she's their escort. And then, once they get into the point at which their submarines are a threat, they have the anti submarine warfare escort. There were, on this operation, five stragglers that didn't get sunk, and two which did. Two which did got sunk by U-96. But this convoy is the target. This convoy is the critical point. But the problem for them is Ramillies. It's quite simple. They're looking for her, they're looking for the convoy, and then they come up it and they see this. It's a been modernized and refitted during World or during the interwar years, but not as much as Royal Oak had been, and certainly not as much as the Queen Elizabeth class had been. It's basically there for a World War One battleship with slight additions. But it's got eight fifteen inch guns. And it doesn't have to chase you. That's the thing. In many ways, the R-Class is the perfect battleship to have escorting a convoy. Because they're not fast enough to chase anyone. They're really not. They are just going to sit with the convoy. They're just going to sit with the convoy. And if you get close, they'll take you out. They're not going to try hunting you down. So, for any ship like Sharnos and Nisenau, the purpose of which, you know, to try and get to the convoy, plans of, well, one of us can draw Ramleys off and the other one can attack the convoy, it's a great idea, it's a great plan they were considering, but it wasn't going to work. Luchens knew this. He spotted this the moment he worked it out it was an R-Class. He seems to have worked that one out, because... The captain of Scharnhorst tries it, and he tells them off. Don't do that. Scharnhorst was the captain thinking, well, th they would have followed me. No, there is no scenario where an R-Class is going to follow you, because he can't catch you. As aggressive as a British officer is, they're not going to do that. And besides, their mission isn't to sink you. Their mission is to protect the convoy. There are fast battleships for which they'll be calling aircraft groups, carrier groups, etc. They'll be calling who are coming to sink you. If you stay in their fighting range for long enough, they will sink you quite happily. And I have done this in UAD, in Ultimate Adrenals video, but I've done this in other scenarios. And believe it or not, 
Ram Elite can give a good account of self versus the 11 inch guns of the Sharnos and Nisenat. Um, she usually, in most things, sinks at least one of them, or severely damages both. Often gets incapacitated herself, but she does enough damage to them, they get sunk. And there is the whole thing that, let's put it this way, there is this caveat that if they succeed and then attack but get severely damaged and don't manage to therefore sink that much of the convoy and then get sunk themselves, that's actually going to undermine the German war effort. Especially as, at the, this point, they're the only two actually in service battleships the Germans have. So if both get lost in operation, it looks kind of um, bad. Again, you can hear the perception, you can hear the spin. Ah, uh, yes. They're two new ships, yeah, two mighty ships. They managed to, uh, they managed to beat up and pretty much sink one of our ships, or sink, even sink one of our World War One, one of our R-Class battleships, our slowest, weakest battleships. They got some merchant ships, maybe a dozen or so of them as well. It's a terrible, terrible thing. We sunk them both. They're gone now. Germany's now got no battleships left. Basically, that spins as they threw the dice. The dice, well, rolled quite well for them. They got fours. But the trouble is then we threw sixes. Just didn't work. It's a perception thing. And what's really fun is Ramleys leaves the convoy on the 10th of February. They sight it on the 8th of February. 700 miles east of Halifax. And this is that. If they'd been a couple of days later, or a cut a few days earlier, they might have actually, they'd been about a week or so earlier, they might have actually managed to find a convoy which wasn't escorted. But as it was, they turn up, they turn up to this convoy, and they find Ramleys going, Hello, have you come to play? They decide they haven't come to play. As mentioned, Sharnos captain, he was, um, Properly named Kurt Caesar Hoffman. Violated almost every order he could to try and get Ramleys to chase him. I mean, the, the guy comes within 12 miles of the convoy. And Ramleys just isn't chasing him. And to tell you how good the uh, equipment is on the Ramleys, they Fought and reported to Tovey that it was an Admiral Hipper class cruiser, um, possibly the Hipper. There were some. Uh, to Tovey also seems to have thought it might have been the Shear, but let's be honest, the Shear is a Deutschland class. And whilst there are some similarities in the silhouette. The Hippers do have four turrets versus the uh, Deutschen class's two principal main turrets. It creates a slightly different outline and a far less staggered outline. So they leave them alone. And they go off and they go around, they hit some stragglers, and then they head for the next hope of convoy, okay? This is, this is definitely, he, Luchens had heard that there were a couple of battleships operating out of Halifax, so there's a chance there. But there's nothing operating out of Sierra Leone. There's nothing. None of their intelligence suggests there's anything down at Sierra Leone. So let's go take down the SL convoys. Now, they're big, important convoys. They're coming up, to, they're, they're coming up from Sierra Leone. They're, they are coming up with all the goods from Africa and India that aren't going through the Mediterranean. They're coming up with all these wonderful supplies, rubber from Malaya, all sorts of critical things for war, for water industry. Yeah, let's go, let's go take them out.
Historically, of the 275 convoys, 27 were attacked. Um, a total of 78 ships lost on that convoy route. It's a fairly safe route. It's that convoy route, which uh, convoy of which um, Captain Philip Vian and his travel class destroyers and their Polish assistant destroyer abandon when the Bismarck is needs to be intercepted and they race across the Atlantic to take over from the cruisers in making sure the Bismarck doesn't slip away during the night before her final engagement with Rodney and King George V. It's that convoy route. Now, this is quite a big gamble and this is in terms of that earlier slide again. This is the downward point. Now, you might have noticed, I'm not talking about how many times they hit stragglers, etc. If you want to go and look up the number of stragglers and look up when they managed to find individual ships, there are many accounts of that. But the thing was, that wasn't the purpose of what they were out for. They want this whole convoy. Because the image, if you can hoover up an entire convoy, oh... That's so corrosive to British national identity and a projection of power. It was it would be beyond belief. And that's what they were after. That's what they wanted to do, to corrode it, to undermine it, to undermine the British ability to fight and show the world they were fighting. Small problem with this convoy, just a, just a small convoy problem with this convoy. Um, it's called HMS Malaya. She's a Queen Elizabeth class. Okay, she hasn't been upgraded like War Spite, Valiant, or Queen Elizabeth. Um, but she's still a Queen Elizabeth class. She just happens to be with SL-67. You know, what are the odds? Lutyens goes from finding an R-class with a convoy to finding Malaya, a Queen Elizabeth class with a convoy. I mean... It's a good, very good job for him he didn't bump, bump into a third convoy. At that rate, he'd have possibly found the one with... Well, I think at a certain point, Nelson <laughs> is dispatched to join some convoys. Uh, at various points, the Royal Navy does dispatch um, uh, various ships around to go and uh, back up convoys. It's actually HMS Rodney, not Nelson. Sorry. Nelson was off being flagship. Rodney was sent to join a convoy, and frankly, as we know, Rodney has a habit of chasing Nizer now. She does. This is actually the series of operations where that happens. Um, it's after Rodney has left her convoy, after escorting it. But at certain points, you have both Rodney and King George V escorting convoys in this period. Because again, what's the British options for? If they want to defend a convoy, they need at least one battleship with the convoy to damage two. Again, though, if the Germans have been sending out free ships, let's say they'd waited for Bismarck to, uh, Bismarck to be ready, well, then one battleship would no longer be enough. If you want to do those scenarios, you stick even HMS Malaya here versus Bismarck at Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, her odds go way down. Her odds go way down. Her odds even of doing sufficient damage to them go way down. So that means you either have to combine, let's say, find another, find an R-class to back her up, in which case they're, you're using two of your battleships to escort any one convoy. But you also, as I said, have to find four battleships for each task force, which is hunting each hunting group. Thank fate, whatever. Hitler didn't have patience. Neither did much of the German high command, let's be honest. And so, they end up rocking up and spotting uh, HMS Malaya. Now, 
there is another small problem with spotting HMS Malaya. Malaya, unlike Ramley's, has aircraft up patrolling. And, um, well, on the 7th of March, it was an aircraft from HMS Malaya which spotted the Scharnhorst Nice and Out. 350 miles north of the Cape Verde Islands. Now, the battleship sighted the convoy uh, roughly 300 miles to northeast of the Cape Verdes later that day. But this means that Malaya has been sending out messages saying exactly who's out near her and has been preparing. And Lutyens identifies Malaya quite quickly. <sighs> what do you do? What do you do? Well, he comes up with a cunning plan. He calls the submarines. And he wants the submarines to target Malaya. And once they have sunk Malaya, then he will go in and destroy the convoy. It's a minimal risk effort. It's a minimal risk. After all, the submarines will guaranteed to sink Malaya. As we often hear, submarines are guaranteed to sink the ships they're going to target. And the two submarines do go in. They ambush the convoy. They sink five ships. Not one of those five ships is HMS Malaya. Not one of those five. And so when the German battleships um, find the convoy at 1.30 p.m. or 13.30 hours on the 8th of March and attempt to they attempt to attack at 17.30 hours when they realize that the vessel which they thought was a merchant ship coming towards them is HMS Malaya going hello I've been expecting you it's how can I put this to the scene it's when you um how do I put it? Have two young, fit, probably burglars coming into a house in the middle of the night and they think there's an old man there. Just an old man on his own. But they think they could do it. You know, it's going to be easy. And as the old man walks down the stairs towards them, the robe falls open and they realize this is an old man who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's old, but oh my lord, what has he been doing with his life? And we'd rather not be here. We can outrun him. We're not sure we can outfight him. That's the scenario. Okay. Actually, well, let's use Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's quite old, but as you know, quite well. So basically, they thought it was just a harmless old man they were going up against, and uh, no, instead they found it was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Good luck. They go to 31 knots as quickly as they can and get away. Don't worry. <coughs> Force H, though, is coming south at this point, and it's only by the sheer smallest margins they manage to avoid it. I mean, you look at some of the aircraft search patterns being flown, and the fact they aren't seen is... So close. And Force H back up Malaya in escorting the convoy to, until mid-March. But, you know, for the next week or so. It, it, it's, it's rather nice of Force H to turn up. But, yeah, Renown, Ark Royal, we're out hunting. With HMS Sheffield and some destroyers. They'd been alerted quite early on because of Malaya's aircraft spotting them. So they were coming south quite quickly. <laughs> It's just, it's not a good experience, and yeah, Force H. It's the other reason why SL convoys are rarely, um, how do I put this politely, something which surface groups, are uh, surface forces and surface raiders are going to action towards, because quite literally the physical embodiment of the British plan for dealing with surface raiders 
developed in the interwar years of fast task forces built around fast capital ship, usually a battle cruiser at this point, and a fast carrier. It's Force H. Now, again, you can say, well, Shan Horse versus Nisenau and. Um, Sha uh, Renown versus Shan Horse and Nisenau, that's, that's. that's surely on the side of Shan Horse and Nisenau. Well, they'd already had one run in with her, and thanks to their own orders from Hitler, uh, they hadn't exactly come with that with a glowing recommendation. Yes, they did score some hits, but. The fact is, Renown had hit them harder, and was doing much more aggressive action. Have them in a scenario where they've got Renown, backed by Ark Royal's aircraft, and some destroyers, coming in from one direction, and Malaya probably coming at them from the other direction, because under those circumstances, Malaya probably would abandon the convoy to come play, uh, to come and fight. That's not a good scenario for them. The odds are they get hit by torpedoes and are slowed down, at which point Malaya, they're not going to be able to run away from Malaya. Malaya combined Renown, Ark Royal, and those destroyers. That could have been the end of them. Now, they would have taken... I do, do expect them to take some ships with them. I don't expect them to go down and take nothing. They're going to extract a price. But again, to sink both Shan Horse and Eisenhower... What price would the Royal Navy be willing to pay? Would that price be renaming HMS Vanguard, the HMS Renown, in honour of a ship which has gone down bravely fighting? In a glorious victory? Again, it's the PR battle. You finish off a ship as quickly as you can, calling it Renown, and, you know, show the strength of Britain. We've lost the ship, but we've replaced it with an even better one that we've quickly managed to build. How many battleships have you built, Germany? That sort of thing. It's... it's, Or it might even be a sister to, Renown, uh, to Vanguard. They call Renown and rush through. In which case, that is a really interesting rolling stone for history. At this point... They are turned off. And how have they been doing this all the time? Again, they've got supply ships out, which have come out the same route. They come out around Norway. They are resupply from France. This is what these merchant ships do. And this is another reason why the Royal Navy do not like stragglers. They do not like merchant ships sailing alone. Why? Because it makes it more difficult for them to identify these vessels. The more merchant ships, the Allied merchant ships are grouped in the convoys, the more any merchant ship out on its own sticks out like a sore thumb when it's spotted as being an exception, as being something unexpected. It helps the Royal Navy if everyone's in a convoy. They get resupplied. They need to be resupplied. And while they're being resupplied... <laughs> These are being reorientated. And again, as I said, this is all about bluff. You have King George V, Rodney, assigned to some convoys. And then you have Nelson and Nigeria, uh, along with destroyers, are uh, pretty much sitting just south of Iceland. Their plan being to accept any raiders trying to get back to Germany. So, to get back to Germany, you have to go the Norway route. You're not going to get through the Channel. That's the British perception. We know what happens with the Channel Dash, but as I've said in other videos about that, that is a uniquely bumbled set of circumstances. You have a whole load of people who are organising air patrols, which are supposed to be the key part of watching for them, who don't understand the importance of their air patrols just think they are just being flown for the sake of being flown, rather than think, hang on, these are being flown as critical things to keep the Germans in those ports. And all three patrols go down. Any one of those patrols had actually been working, the Channel Dash wouldn't have happened, because the Charnos and Eisenhower would have been spotted, their group would have been spotted, and everything could have been timed, and they would have been intercepted by overwhelming force. Doesn't happen. Because of 
bureaucracy and people failing to read between the lines of what's mattering about their role. Yeah, you have it. Now, what's interesting is whilst they are between the 17th and 21st of March, they are added to convoys. So for four days, they're defect and they're protecting Halifax convoys. This happens, you know, whilst this is going on, the Germans are intercepting stragglers from some of those convoys. Not from the convoys which are being escorted, but, you know, other convoys around there. And it's on the 16th of March that Ronley cites Neisenau. Now, there are interesting discussions about this. Um, Neisenau is going slowly around a merchant vessel that she sort of sunk rescuing survivors. Rodney spots her. They chase her. Neisenau has to slow, build up speed. They don't manage to start getting away from her till they're going over 26 knots. In fact, they find that she's still gaining on them up until about 26 knots. They reach 26 knots, and then they're sort of paratite, and then they go past it. Which is where we get the idea that maybe, maybe, Dalrymple Hamilton, has, who was the captain of H.M.S. Rodney at the time, had done some sort of pact with the devil for more speed for his ship. Or maybe he just didn't care he knew the ship was a in for a refit of its engines so frankly he was going to use those engines like he'd stolen them or alternatively you have the scenario that the British might not have been completely honest about how capable their engines on their two very new battleships that they built in the 1920s were um you know, you, it could have all been very conservative estimates because, well, you know, you have to estimate conservatively because you can't oversell something. And then you have some very good chief engineers who know how to maximize the capabilities of the pipework. Let's put it this way. I am not a big fan, and I, this is why I started off the video with discussion I did, of the various conspiracy theories about the Royal Navy hiding their true intentions in terms of what their war plans were. I doubt that's likely. The Royal Navy really doesn't have the problem need to do that. The Royal Navy, as said, is big enough it can afford to have multi-layered war plans and have multiple options. That makes sense. You... The Royal Navy is never going to put all its eggs in one basket, especially not when it's as large as it is in the 1900s and the 1920s and 30s. It's just not going to go, right then, we're going to go all in on this, and that's going to be our only option for doing this. We're going to have one scenario for how to deal with this problem, one and only one. They're not going to do that. But can I see the Royal Navy in the 90, scenario of the 1920s getting creative with how they assess the power and capabilities of certain ships which they had to give date hand data over to everyone yeah i can let's be honest these are the same people who um apply the letter of the law but not necessarily the spirit by wholesale using water as armour, by claiming they need more feed water than they actually do for the ships. Because that doesn't count towards standard displacement, whereas steel does. Yeah, I can, I can see that Navy um, <clears throat> being creative. Very creative. When... They actually sink ships on the 15th and 16th. King George V is dispatched to go patrol the area where a merchant vessel has been sunk. Again, the view is that a King George V on her own can probably deal with Sean Austin Eisenhower. And honestly, they're not really wrong. 
Uh, yes, she has only 10 14 inch guns, but she's pretty much the uh, best built available King George V class. She's the most worked up of them, and she's a fast battleship in her own right. And again, with King George V, uh, it's an official top speed of 28 knots. It's honestly a top speed of 28 knots. Again, the same Navy, which told you they have a top speed of 23 knots. That one on top honestly has a top speed of 28 knots. And 125,000 shaft horsepower to get it there. So, they're shadow boxing. And this is what all these deployments are. They're all about shadow boxing. The British are securing an area after the Germans have been there. They know the Germans aren't probably going to still be there because for the Germans to still be there after signals have gone out, telling them that's where, telling the British where that's where they've been attacking merchant vessels, would be silly. Would be absolutely silly. And in fact, Lutyens receives orders on the 11th of March to um, cease operations by the 17th in order to support Hipper and Scheer's return to Germany. The idea that to do the support, he was to he was to make a diversion through the Azores and the Canary Islands, i.e., divert British forces away from Hipper and Shear. Then take his ships to Brest. The idea being that they would be prepared in Brest to join the raid into Atlantic with the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen scheduled for April. Now this of course all presumes that they can be repaired uh, from all their sea journeys and all their travels in Brest in time for that. And one of the things that the German naval staff don't seem to understand is the sheer toll the sea is taking on the Scharnhorst and Eisenau. The sheer toll it is taking on them. At one point they're estimating Neisenau's engines are going to need a month's worth of work to get them back to what they were. By the time it gets into Brest, it's more like three months they reckon it's going to take. And that was with people who they actually trusted to do it. Still, the operation almost does end in more problematic things because, well... Toby reinforces his force south of Iceland with uh, Queen Elizabeth and HMS Hood. So he has Hood, Queen Elizabeth and Nelson along with Nigeria grouped together south of Iceland. Uh, if um, Hipper or Shear had actually got caught south of Iceland by that force there is not much chance of them surviving. Um, neither of them are going to be outpacing Hood, and neither of them are going to be outfighting either Queen Elizabeth or Nelson. It's just not going to happen. But the more interesting thing is that Ark Royal's aircraft, some of her aircraft actually detect Scharnhorst and Eisner. But the aircraft radio wasn't working. So it had to return to the carrier to report that it had seen the ships. They mentioned that the, air, the aircraft, uh, they went against their own training and their own thing. Was they were supposed to mention both the course it was at when they fin lost sight of it and the course it had been at and they had been on when they'd been first sighted. That's the standard you're supposed to provide. But they only provided the course it was on and they, the vessel was on when it was last sighted. So A, the Somerville's given the wrong uh, the wrong course because the Germans have spotted the aircraft and changed their course. And B, even worse than that, he gets it not only delayed by the fact it has to be handed back in when they get back to the carrier, but then it's delayed in being transmitted from the carrier to Somerville. So instead of Ark Royal and the rest of Force H being able to intercept Sean Austin Ice now, maybe cause them some damage to stop them getting home, 
they instead have to con uh, content themselves with chasing after some of the merchant vessels which are trying to get home. They capture merchant vessels. They manage to catch them again on the 23rd, sort of the night of the 21st, 21st March, and in the morning, but they are unable to attack due to bad weather. And as such, Tovey gets the orders on the 21st of March to proceed south at full speed. But you have to remember, if he's coming from Iceland to try and get off the Bay of Biscay, he's never going to get there in time. They're also ordering cruisers to head south, and a destroyer flotilla sell is, it goes from Plymouth to try and head south, to, all to try and stop them reaching France. That was helpful. The RAF even ordered, uh, organized a uh, Vickers Wellington bomber force, 25 bombers, that were supposed to be around the clock ready to go against the battleships. But, in the end, it boils down to weather. It was poor weather which prevents the aircraft from Ark Royal being able to intercept the ships and slow them down. If they had done, and stopped them getting in under the defence of land-based air, again, the world changes. As it is, the Germans get into safety. They get home. And then eventually they do this. The Channel Bash. A great example of another bluff operation. So. We started off with this question. Right at the beginning. And I'm going back to it. Through all the slides. The question is this. Tour de force or tour de farce? Well, here's the thing. It's both. It's a tour de force because they actually do it. It's a tour de force because they actually accomplish it. And that's an amazing feat. It's a tour de farce, though, because of the slapstick. They're major targets they fail to get because they've got a single battleship with them. An old World War I barely upgraded battleship for both cases. Which just makes a sort of mockery of the, the power of the German battleships. But more importantly than that, they don't get to achieve the big stop in convoys running. And no point do the convoys stop running. In many ways, what they're doing is actually making the case and strengthening the British argument for convoys. Especially with some of those owners and ship owners who have been most intransient on the subjects. After this, the British managed to enforce convoys out into the Indian Ocean. They, they've got convoys all over the place they're adding in because of this. It's useful. But still, the Germans get home. And that's where it becomes farcical on the British side. Because the amount of opportunities the British have to intercept them. And they don't manage it. Uh, you have the bad communication and the failure of good information reporting coming from the fleet air arm in Ark Royal's case, but that's just the most obvious. You have lots of times where Tovey interprets things as being cruisers when, when the information coming through would suggest they're not. This is one of the things which changes when Bismarck's out. Because Toby has the information that Bismarck is out and he believes Bismarck is out. Whereas when he has the information that they've gone through the Denmark Straits, Toby is mentally going, they wouldn't risk that. They wouldn't risk them. They wouldn't risk it. Imagine the damage if they lost it. They wouldn't be that stupid. They wouldn't risk it. And they do. They do risk it. They do. Because, again, part of war is risk. Part of war is risk. 
So yeah, bit of a tour de force, a bit of a tour de farce on both sides. Ultimately, it's a success from the propaganda perspective, but it's not a success from its strategic and military goals because it doesn't stop those convoys moving. It doesn't cause the British the problems with convoys that actually sinking one of the convoys, one of its targets, would have done. Now, this video was supposed to come out before the last of the year of technology have come out, but the Why No More Battleships, that's out. That came out first because I wanted to redo this one again. And the bonus on the Admiralty prior to World War II, um, and this is from World War One era. Now, again, this is about the same discussion the revisionists we had that one of the often put forward arguments is that revisionism is something which happens later on. No, revisionism can happen right there at the time. Revisionism is a massive part of history and it can happen in real time. It can happen with newspaper writing, it can happen with magazines. It can happen with people trying to shape the narrative. And that can become the cultural memory. A good example of that is the Battle of Atlantic. There is a cultural memory focusing on every single convoy which was a bitter battle. And all of them were a bitter battle, but most of the times the force they were fighting was the North Atlantic, not the Germans. When they were fighting the Germans, it was bad. The Germans were very good and very committed. But as the stats on the H, uh, the HX convoys, etc. show, it doesn't happen as often as some of the movies and some of the cultural memories might suggest. And the fact is also there are periods where it's far worse than others. There are periods where the German submarines are far more successful than others. Where they have the numbers, where they have a, tech, a momentary tech advantage, because it's a constant tech race of who has the upper hand, the escorts or the submarines. It's constant. And those are the memories you remember, the scary moments are what are remembered. But that's not the whole scenario. And it's important to remember that when people start giving you stats today about modern submarines. And start talking about how powerful modern submarines are, how capable they are. Well, it's the same issues you have with modern surface ships. You can't reload vertical launch cells at sea at the moment. We've been flirting with various technologies to try and do it for years, but no one has actually practically implemented it recently. They tried to have something during the Cold War, but they got rid of most of those systems and they've now got to look into it again. Well, you also can't reload torpedoes at sea. So submarines have to return to somewhere safe to be reloaded. And that's their problem, if they run out of torpedoes. And they can't use all their torpedoes for offensive operations. They have to keep some of them for, say, to protect themselves as they come home. Which limits them. No submarine, no warship has an infant magazine. That's a limiting factor. And again, if you're talking about torpedoes, let's say, uh, when do you use them? If you use them on something, you reveal your position. So yes, you might be able to sink something, but it's like in World War II. Do you torpedo a corvette? The British are literally producing them by the dozen. They're going to produce hundreds of the things over the war. The same with the trawlers. If you use a torpedo on it, you're revealing your position. You probably sink it, but you might not. And you've revealed your position. And that's a torpedo which could be used for to sink something which is more valuable to you, the merchant ships. The point is this. 
There is no such thing as a panacea in war. There is no such thing as a perfect weapon system. There is no such thing as something which is a universal answer to all problems. Operation Berlin is a great example in the reality of fighting a conflict. A major conflict. But its lesson is not about Sean Olsen Eisenhower doing this great operation. It's about the perception of the operation being a great operation, even though it doesn't achieve its goals. And the fact that it also at the same time doesn't undermine the British in the way it achieving its goals would have done and actually helps the British in some ways. It's a successful operation in that they do all that stuff they do. They go all the way around the North Atlantic the way they do. They go all the places they do. They make it to France. They sink all the ships they do and yet they don't achieve their goals, they don't disrupt the trade the way they wanted to, and they reinforce the British case. Both sides win. In that regards, it's almost a tour de force for both sides. Thank you very much for watching. On Thursday this week, there'll be the Battle of Sinop. And then next week after that, if not Pearl Harbor. That's going to be a live. That'll be a fun live. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I always finish these videos with a question. And I'm not going to change now. But the question, what is it going to be based on? Well, as you can imagine, I'm tempted, very tempted, to ask a question, you know, an alternate history question. What happens if they get caught? Uh, that's a good question. What happens if they get caught by any of the forces and they actually have to fight and get sunk or damaged? Or I could ask, what happens? What do you think happens if ter if they wait till Bismarck is ready and they go out with Bismarck and Prince Jürgen, and so you have all four ships going off together? Ooh, what would that be like? What would that force be like in effect on in the Atlantic? But no. It's actually a more interesting question, I think. And it's this. What happens, do you think, if they succeed? If they'd found a convoy without a battleship? Now, why am I asking this question? Because even convoys which don't have battleships, the British have task forces running around. Even the ones which are in, you know, even if you're talking about the task force up north in terms of off the coast of Iceland, South Iceland, there are other forces, other forces, Force H, etc. So you attack any large group of merchant ships, there's going to be radio signals getting off and the British, the Royal Navy is going to hear about it and come racing down. So the question is this, what do you think happens if they do hit a convoy? The odds are they still end up they end up in a fight with British capital ships. Which, depending on which capital ships turn up, is not going to be good for them. They might not get away from that, so they might end up getting sunk anyway. But if they've already destroyed a convoy, and at least one of them gets away, what you know, that that's a problem for the British. That's gonna impact the British position. So the question is what happens if they did find their dream an unescorted convoy? What do you think the result is in terms of the wider war effort? In terms of the effects on Britain, on America, on Japan, on World War II as a whole? Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed and hope you found it interesting. Take care.